Hey guys, Tony here with the Patio Slave Podcast, episode 19, uh, recording tonight on uh, July 16th, 2020. I'm here with my buddies Anthony and Nate. How you guys doing? I'm doing great. It uh, we've been looking forward to this one for for a while now, and we'll get into the details of that shortly. Yeah, man, doing great. Thirsty Thursday. Woo. Yeah. Yep. Back on back recording on Thursday. Um, yeah. Last week had a little hiccup, changed some stuff up at the last minute, but we're back tonight with our regularly scheduled uh, recording on Thursday. So, real quick before we get into all that we have for you tonight, the socials at Patio Slave on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, check us out on YouTube. Uh, the Patio Slay podcast channel on YouTube is ever growing. We've added some features. Um, the three of us have dug through our video archives and thrown up some Patio Slave archives from shows. We're all missing live music. So go check out the videos that we've tossed up on there. There's probably, geez, what, 15 videos on there right now yeah. between the yeah. three of us. So yeah, check those out. They're fun. They've been cool to add to and, and, you know, give us something to look forward to on YouTube every now and then to get the live music fix. Um, and, We'll have a playlist coming up after tonight. I'll put that together with uh, the help of these guys and throw that out on any of your music streaming platforms, uh, Apple Music, YouTube Music, Spotify tomorrow um, or Saturday morning, depending on the situation. And uh, yeah, you'll see those. And then, um, yeah, I mean, this has been a fun episode. Tuan, you want to kind of give us the, the runabout of what happened here tonight? Yeah, so we had uh, a guest join us. So we interviewed Chad Neptune. So Chad Neptune was the bassist for the 90s Florida hardcore band Strongarm. And then uh, from there, most of those guys went on to form Further Seems Forever. This was a cool episode. Like he, we definitely clicked with him and, and he really checks a lot of our boxes where he's multi-genre, spans a lot of different eras. You know, Strongarm starting in the early 90s. Won't give too much of that away. But this was a fun one. I hope you guys enjoy it. Yeah, he was awesome. Chad's a good guy. Um, kind of represents what we uh, try to showcase here, which is you know work ethic, being genuine, and just having kind of a kind of a array of genres or different styles of music and and interests and and collectively kind of funneling it into one source. And that's what this is. And Chad's background with um, strong arm and further seems forever, and you know anything in between, and doing covers of like you know bye 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 and you know different and weezer and so forth yeah, weezer, so um yeah. yeah he was really cool and uh, a lot of good insight on on his history and music uh which spans from the early 90s to present so obviously that's a evolution in both how you record music technology wise and just the the scene today versus uh you know early 90s so which is night and day so really cool and gracious for for chad to come on and talk with us today and a cool, a cool little nerdery bit at the end. So check that out too. I mean, that's you're only gonna find that with us. <laughs> the nerdery bits, uh, the the periphery, the fun stuff on the outside. Check that out at the end. Without yeah. uh, you know, without giving it away, here's the rest of the or here's the interview with with Chad. Hey Chad, thanks for joining us on the podcast. We appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, so how you doing? Um, good. Uh, yeah. All things considered, good. Yes, all things considered. Good. Exactly. So appreciate you coming on. I do think it'd be fun to just give a little backstory of how we got you on the podcast and how this all came about. I had posted on my personal Instagram account, more or less a further seems forever, the moon is down, kind of fanboy appreciation post. And you, I assume through hashtags or ats, uh, found it and commented on it, which I thought was super cool. And then a couple days later, I was like, you know what? Chad would be great for this podcast because he spans, you know, almost 30 years musically and spans genres. And I just felt old. But the, <laughs> you just felt old. <laughs> Us too, though. <laughs> you know, we're all over the map. Like, I love 90s hardcore. I love current hardcore. I love hip hop. I love, you know, we, we, we do cover it all. So, yeah, how did you find it? Just through an organic search or? Yeah, I mean, I have like a, anytime someone tags further you know, um, I get it, usually get it in my feed. So yeah, that's how, yeah. That's the magic awesome. of social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And which this, I mean, that, that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago or even five years ago, you know? So it's just, it's cool that it happened, which is probably a good segue into an era where that absolutely would not happen, which is, you know, kind of the early nineties Florida scene. We're, we're really curious about, you know, kind of the years leading up to, the start of strong arm and if you were active in the florida hardcore scene and how that came about and how you guys started yeah um 
All right. So let me let me try to get this timeline right. So I actually I grew up in Florida and I moved to Texas when I was in high school, just a freshman, uh, because my dad's job moved there. Uh, uh, just before I had moved there, I, I was into skating um, and basically the whole skate culture and got into like punk and uh, hardcore just before I moved there. And when I moved there, uh, you know, it was a small town just outside of Dallas um, called Rockwall. And uh, basically there wasn't a lot to do. Like my high school had a rodeo team and it was like, it was a culture shock coming from a city like um, uh, South Florida and then going there. And so I got, I basically started, um, I was like, I just want to learn an instrument. So I just picked bass because I liked that it was big and it was powerful, you know? And so I just kind of got into that there and I met, you know, people there that were in the, like, not so much the scene because we were so much so far out but it wasn't soon after that um i moved back to florida and i had met uh <clears throat> i had met jason bergeron the original singer from strong arm and chris carbonell through my sister and they were in a band called ichthus with a um another guy called dave bean and uh this other guy was playing bass and the bass player was leaving to go to college and Dave Bean was moving he was the singer so it was Jason he was playing guitar and Chris was playing drums and um became really friendly with like basically became like as good of friends as you can get and um you know they asked me if I wanted to play bass and you know I wasn't like a great bass player or anything we just wanted to get our aggression out and you know, have some avenue, you know, and Chris was living with Josh, um, and Josh was the youngest, and Josh was in another band at the time called Endure with Nick, and a guy named Mike Hurley, and some other guy, another guy, Jamie, and Endure was like a straight-edge hardcore band in South Florida, and they were actually pretty, pretty well-known around the scene, and like playing a lot of shows, um, they ended up like kicking Josh out and starting a new band like uh, called Tension. And um, Josh, uh, you know, we were like, oh, this is amazing because Josh is like the, you know, he was like the engine behind the songwriting, you know, uh, for, and just, you can tell like some people in bands, like there's always one guy in the band that's on like a little bit on another level. Yep. <clears throat> Josh was kind of that guy um so we were like hey man you want to play with us he's like yeah because Ichthus was terrible like <laughs> I mean it wasn't terrible but it wasn't what we wanted and it wasn't it just wasn't inspiring mm -hmm. yeah. but we always um you know kind of the impetus of the whole thing was you know we were Christians and being in like the hardcore scene and uh punk scene like we wanted to kind of break down the stereotypes that go behind all that. Um, mm -hmm. And because it was just like, it, you were shunned if you were a Christian in that scene, because, you know, in society, the popular thought was to, you know, Oh, you're a Christian. And like, so you know, Christianity pisses a lot of people off because they burned a lot of people. So we just like, our, our kind of mission was like, hey, let's break down some of those stereotypes and let's like share like ourselves, you know, what we have with other people, you know? Um, Hell yeah. So, so, you know, it wasn't short long after that, like Josh joined the band, we asked Nick if he wanted to play second guitar and he was playing bass and tension and, and he was not doing that and he wanted to do something a little bit different so so that's how the, the nucleus of strong arm kind of kind of formed there south florida was an interesting scene because there wasn't a lot of um, bands that came through like national bands didn't want to come this far south mm. so the scene kind of like like we everyone made it made it their own hardcore bands we play with ska bands and punk bands and 
boy bands and th and all these different bands would play and like all the same people would come to shows it was very different you know so that actually kind of leads me to another question you you probably played on a lot of mixed bills then right i mean there's just yeah. oh yeah i mean there's a lot of punk obviously influence in in some of the heavier stuff too but for sure like you guys playing with somebody that sounds completely different than you night after night that, that's pretty cool you get exposed to a lot of different stuff yeah it was great and you know i think one of the thing was as we were playing you know the other bands they they kind of welcomed us with open arms they weren't uh i mean there were some people that like just hated us because we were christians or but they respected us because they they knew we weren't like fake like christians like we weren't coming in there like oh you know trying to just pull our way into a conversation or whatever it is and we were from the scene and we're real we weren't like i was i'm i'm from a jewish background like i was raised jewish like my parents are jewish i had a bar mitzvah and like all this stuff like i didn't wasn't raised in that culture and so i just think like like in the scene was so tight knit everyone knew each other and was everyone's friends like to this day you know to this day that's it's, cool it's, yeah and uh no i mean strong arm we went through you know some lineup changes like at, at one point um jason um well so chris and nick ended up leaving the band um and that was kind of like we call it an age of chaos because it was just like a time period where, you know, we didn't see eye to eye and, uh, you know, without getting too much into the details, but uh, Chris and um, Nick left and Jason had a friend that his name was Bob and, and he came into the band at that time and he was in a, a local, like a really popular, like good metal band called Ambugalard and he, like the, um, bass player from Marilyn Manson was in that band with him um, but they were, That's cool. they were like pretty pretty popular around here like um yeah like Marilyn Manson they practiced across like, from us is like pretty interesting uh but uh yeah so Bob joined for a while and, and that's when we also got Steve and Steve um so we knew Steve um, from playing, we played a lot in Tampa and St. Petersburg area, and uh, and we knew him through a friend of ours named John, and he was roommates with John, and and um, he was just one of these guys. Like he played drum. I remember we were at like Cornerstone Fest, and he was playing drums on like pots and pans, and like it blew my mind, like how like <laughs> good cool. this guy was. I mean, and if anyone's ever tried to start a band, they knew they know that it's really hard to find a good drummer. Yeah. But he just, I mean, Steve was another Josh type guy. He just had this raw innate like rhythm and was just, yeah, like on another level. So I think that like helped boost us to like be able, like we kind of had this like, air in the band like we wanted to really be thoughtful about our music and not just you know like oh this sounds cool okay that'll do just to have like a song we wanted to like think through every transition and every um, part of the song you know so that helped us kind of get to that level um yeah so um then after a while jason and bob decided they didn't want to do the band anymore and it, and i don't really blame them uh you know, when we were doing hardcore, it was like, it, there was never even a thought that we would have like the ability to like record an album or like be on a record label or go on a tour or anything like that. Like it was just so far fetched at that moment, you know, at that time. And uh, so at that point we were like, hey, let's, you know, we were friends still with Chris and Nick, let's have, Chris and Nick do come back, you know? And I think that's where we really hit our stride with Strong Arm. Um, we uh, did Advent of a Miracle and we just had some of the best times of our lives during that, that era, I think. It's funny when you think, when I, like when I think back about that era, 
I feel, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I feel now that it was much bigger than it was. You know what I mean? Like back then, 25 years ago, you know, you guys are probably more or less a regional band. But nowadays, 25 years later, uh-huh. you guys have a legacy. You know what I mean? And is that strange yeah. to even think about? Like we're having this, I mean, you're chatting with us 25 years later who are super curious about, you know, kind of that scene because it was, yeah. it was packed with a lot of heavy hitters. It was, um, yeah, it's actually kind of mind blowing. Um, we, um, so like that era, it's just, um, you know, we did it and we didn't think we we're just like, Oh, we're just, that's it. You know, uh, there's a million bands out there and I know you connect with certain bands and things like that, but there was something interesting about that era too, especially like there's this concept of like spirit filled hardcore that kind of um, happened around us. And we were like in a bubble in South Florida. We were like, Oh, we're like the only Christian hardcore band out here. And then we met other Christian hardcore bands that were out there like, focused and unashamed and overcome and six feet deep you know from all different parts of the country and we're all like hey wait you guys are into this oh wait you know and it was like this really bonding moment and i think there was a whole subculture of kids that like were just wow finally i feel like i belong somewhere and that's kind of like what i felt when i got into like punk and hardcore like you know, I, I think Josh, he would always like mention, he would be like, you know, some people would be like, Metallica got me through high school. And for us, it was the descendants got us through, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. like, just, mm-hmm. just things like that. And, and I think people were thirsty at that time. And it was a different era because you couldn't, you couldn't actually like go online and just type hardcore band. You know, you had to like buy the records and see the thank you lists and like, oh, this sounds cool. Oh, or read a zine. Like some of our best friends, like Stretch Armstrong, we met because we sent Scott a demo and he used to do a a zine in South Carolina. And he was like, oh, I'm in a band called Stretch Armstrong and you're in Strong Arm. And like, we just became good friends just from that, you know? Mm -hmm. It's funny listening to you talk about that um that's kind of what we did growing up and that's yeah. kind of why the three of us are friends as long as we're friends and why this started was uh you know we were reading the liner notes and finding finding different bands that way in our own little corner of you know southern maine so um uh, yeah it's cool to hear you say that's why i reacted the way i did i'm like yeah that's exactly us yeah, <laughs> cool. yeah. so wait so you two are in southern maine and nathan's in california Southern yeah. california yep yep san diego where in Maine? Uh, just south of Portland. Yep. I uh, see my my dad, my stepdad. He was from there, from Portland. Oh wow! Oh right yeah. on. Nice. Yeah. So. So we can definitely relate to, like you said, you know, growing up, not many bands would tour down there, and that's kind of what it was for us. We'd have to go to, you know, Boston for a lot of gigs. Um, yeah. Growing up, and it's 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 gotten better, but. Yeah. I remember one of the weirdest shows we played. Um, as further we played in it was in uh, maine at, and it was some like private school in the middle of winter huh. like in the middle of nowhere like i don't even know where but it was like really bizarre like uh college and no nah, it was i i think it was like a prep school or hmm. something Interesting. and i just remember we were all like what was going on here and like it just that's, seemed yeah, so a, random at that time. Well, in the middle of winter, I mean, <laughs> nobody yeah. wants to come here in the middle of winter. I mean, I remember I was like, this is probably the coldest I've ever been in my yeah. life. Yeah. That and <laughs> once in Minnesota. And I, I don't think, yeah, it's impossible. Yet. I mean, that that just <clears throat> proves the point that like Maine, Southern Maine, and your experience in Florida were similar because it was off the map. And if you wanted to bring yeah. a band like yours to to our market we had to do it someone clearly did that diy that wasn't like a major promoter or even like a small time promoter like mass concerts or something like that so um must have been kind of on the fly like what can i get for a venue like we've seen shows in maine in like teen center clubs billiard Billiard halls yes (laughs) you know expo centers stage dives off the uh billiard table yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah, it's the best 
I mean, we used to, yeah, like BFW halls and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. That, I mean, a lot of times, I mean, that's where we kind of broke our, our, our made our dues, you know? I mean, we just kind of had this attitude of we're, we're just going to play every show that we can. Just why not, you know? And it's interesting. I know we're kind of getting off topic, but. That's what we do a lot here. Of <laughs> tangents. We love tangents. No, I mean, a lot of bands will, you know, they'll ask me, well, how do I do this? And how do I, and I'm like, and I just remember watching a Fagazi video and, and Ian McKay said, said it best. He's like, hey, don't worry about being professional. Worry about playing music, you know? Like, don't think about it too much. You're so, people get so worried about printing merch and having managers and booking agents and blah, 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 that they lose sight of really the reason why they're doing, doing it. <clears throat> and my biggest thing was do it with your friends, do it with people you enjoy being around. It doesn't matter if they're the greatest musicians or not, you know, you grow into it. Getting back to that, everything's in context thing. So 25 years ago, it's a mid nineties. If I listen to a strong arm album now, I mean, we're all music geeks here. So where my head goes, it's like, holy shit, this came out before all the stuff that's out now. It came out before all the early 2000s stuff. Like, how the hell did they even, like, who were, who, who were your influences? Because, like, if I look at, like, the Triple B Records lineup, like, bands like Magnitude, I hear, like, I don't want to diss them, but it's, like, recycled riffs from this era. So, like, where did you guys come up with that? Like, who were your influences, basically? Um, so... I think we were, we were influenced he heavily by what was popular at the time um, for a certain amount of time. Um, so, you know, obviously like the early stuff, like, you know, Minor Threat, Gorilla Biscuits and Youth to Today and like bands like that. But then like, I remember when Earth Crisis, their first seven inch came out, um, All Out War, we were like, this is awesome. Now it's a horrible recording, but the reason that we liked it was the gang vocals. And I think there's like certain like things about records that we kind of latched onto. Like early Snapcase stuff, they would, it was very rhythmic over like a, like a melodic bottom, right? Yeah. I don't, you know, no, I, so when Looking Glass Self came out, it like, it was like a, this new thing. And I think we were influenced by that, but then we were influenced by a lot of things too. Like um, Steve has a huge influence with like Jesus Lizard and like, uh, um, you know, Fagazi and Killing Time and like a bunch of, the, you know, bands out of the genre. And I think we started to get into that mode where we were like, okay, well, we like fast stuff and we like it. Let's, you know, we like melody too, like descendants, as I mentioned, and let's bring it together. Let's try to bring it together somehow, you know? And we're also influenced by a lot of like our, our peers locally. Like, um, so Matt Fox of Shilu, he, um, him and Josh were actually Josh's first band. They were called Planet X. They, they were like, when he was like 13 or something, like they grew up like writing, music together you know and i think that's a, a lot of reason why people have a similarity between shia Lude and strong arm because and also steve played in both but you know so we kind of fed off each other you know in a way but i think for me i think what i brought to the band was i was able to see the what we were doing as a whole and I just was like, I, let, we need to make this interesting rather than go from just this part to this part. Let's figure out a clever way to transition into that and like tastefully and not like what the hell is going on here, you know? And I think it kind of developed into our own sound, you know? <clears throat> and it's interesting because you talk about like, yeah, well, I, we're more popular now than we ever were. I mean, we we barely like. It's funny because Josh did a podcast um, recently, and he was talking about some of the stories that, you know, from tours and like, you know, we got paid like pizza. 
So like <laughs> a lot of times we didn't have, you know, we sleep wherever we'd go, you know, well, we loved it, but that was never the motivation. The motivation was, you know, just the music and being able to like experience that with our friends, you know? Yep. Yep. But so, and I think that gave us a good perspective. Like we, we just never thought we were going to get anywhere. So we weren't like chasing this like dragon. Yeah. You were doing it strictly because that's what you wanted to do. And you were doing it on your own terms, which is yeah. also really cool. Um, and then from there, like you said, the band had broken up, but four of the members went on to form Further Seems Forever. And the sound is a complete departure for the most part in a lot of ways is that, yeah, kind of, sure. does that kind of go back to like your kind of uh mix of different bands that are kind of all working together in in south florida to kind of yeah and, and you know we started so you know early on in hardcore i'm like i don't like anything that's you know doesn't fit into this box but you know as you get a little older and you start playing uh different types you you start like realizing that box is very confining and we were listening to a lot of other music, like saying Jawbox and this, you know, lots of other music that more often than we were listening to heavy stuff. And also, we were, our lives were changing. You know, uh, Josh got married, uh, Chris got married, uh, Chris Carbonell got married, and, uh, you know, Nick was getting married, and, you know, there, there was just a lot going on, and we were just like, you know what, strong arms just kind of run its course. I just can't see doing this much longer because, you know, it's really hard to keep writing and topping yourself and all those things. And if you're not like totally in tune with what you're doing, you know, what's the point, you know? Um, but we always, we knew we were like, oh, we still want to play music. We're never going to not want to play music. So and so even while we were doing Strong Arm, Josh and I uh, would get together in my room. Josh actually married my sister. So we'd get together in my room and start writing tunes. And we were listening to like Weezer and some like more mainstreamish type, sure. you know, stuff. And, and um, you know, I remember we were like, we actually had Matt Fox. We were like, oh, Matt Fox, you're going to play second guitar. And he's like, awesome. But then and Steve wanted to do it. And then he was, um, Matt was like doing Shia Lube full time and just sort of was like half in it. And we still argue to this day about that. But um, yeah, so he was supposed to be in it, but then Nick wanted to do it. So we were like, oh, awesome. So that's how it was like four of the five members, you know? Awesome. So then, um, you know, I guess the next question was singer, right? Yeah. How'd that come about? <laughs> it wasn't. We had other ones too, but I mean, if you oh, want okay. to talk about it. <laughs> um, yeah. So, no, I mean, so there is a local band um, that we strong and played with a ton of times called the Bacon Andes, and we're pretty good friends with them. Um, and uh, Chris uh, Caraba was, was one. So they had two singers. They had Chris and they had John Owens. And you know, we, it's funny because when we started the band, we were like, you know, what kind of singer do we want? We are like, we kind of want a guy like the guy from Sensefield, you know? And okay. So we, you know, it was interesting. It's not like you can go online and be like, hey, band looking for a singer. And like, you know, just, you know, it was like, okay, who do you know? And you just sat there and thought really hard, okay. And then you're like, oh, well, you know, the Bacon Andes, I think they're breaking up. Maybe Chris will want to do something. So I remember uh, approaching him at a party and being like, hey, you know, we're doing this. And he was always uh, like strong arm and stuff. And Chris always had a great attitude. Like, it was just like a good guy to be around, you know. And so that was like our main thing. We, we just, we needed to be able to get along whoever it was mm -hmm. and at this point we had been playing music so long together that you know our group kind of seemed like a click almost you know pretty inclusive which I had come to realize later but um so you know it's just like hey you know we're we're 
doing this new band and we'd like, love to, you know, jam and see, you know, what, you know. Oh no, actually I remember he had a tape of some solo stuff that he did, which was like some early dashboard stuff eventually. And we were like, oh, this is cool, you know, and we got together, just see how it goes, you know. And I think the first time we got together, we played like one tune and just hung out and had and just had drank beer or something. Like it wasn't like like, oh, let's see your chops and this and that, you know. It was yeah. I was gonna say when he brought that to the table, so you guys had some kind of collective um instrumentals kind of put together prior as well. So you kind of meshed both yeah. together. I think we had like one or two songs and then Chris had some stuff that he had written and, um, you know, which is funny because, you know, we were so like, everything had to be super interesting to play. Otherwise we were, we were kind of snooty like that, you know, in the first that bunch of things that Chris brought to the table, we were like, oh, I don't know. It's not really us, you know? And it's like, you know, screaming infidelities is like what it came out to be. So, you know, I had to joke around with them that too. I'm like, yeah, I know. We just, we're wrong. I, you know, I'm the bad guy. You're the good guy. Actually, I'd love to hear that with like the further seems forever tinge on it. Awesome. It probably yeah, wouldn't that been be cool. as good as it is now. But yeah. But it was interesting for Chris because Chris was a singer songwriter, right? And he played, he was always used to playing guitar and singing in like in the Bacon Andes. So coming into uh, like we write, we write so backwards, you know, like, like a lot of people will write a bunch of material and then they'll start refining. And we, we write, if we don't like this, done. Like we don't like keep a backlog, it takes us forever. And, um, you know, Chris came in and, you know, was able to kind of sift through that weird process and find how to work in our framework, like in bring melody, you know, with strong arm, it was a lot easier because it's tone deaf for the most part. It's like, ah, you know, <laughs> you're like, you know, it's, it's about passion and cadence yeah. and stuff, but yeah, on the message and all that. Yeah. And which is great but it's different and now he's got to find the melody figure out the phrasing and the rhythm which is weird because a lot of people to this day they're like oh is that part is that three four is that you know five mm -hmm. six and we're like I, I don't know I mean we don't know I mean we just like we're not trained or anything like that Steve's like you know I don't know just a savant but yeah it's it's just like I I know that it's weird and that's kind of the reason why we like it. But yeah, so it was a little bit, it was it was interesting to see what Chris brought to the table. And I, you know, I think, I mean, it was it, it just like we clicked, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was probably pretty cool, though, to go from doing it one way to doing it another way. You know, just a different evolution, a different, you know, thought process. It was process. super exciting because yeah. it's like uh, when you're writing a song, and you see it come together it's there's a feeling that you get that only people that play music kind of understand and to see to see it come together with like melody in a way that hardcore didn't have was like really gratifying yeah that's awesome that's cool and you get to see kind of the different spokes to the industry that maybe you hadn't you know with with strong arm with that right so you're able to kind of go into a different direction and see all the opportunities that kind of come out of that, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, again, it was just, I mean, we did approach it and that's why we didn't call it a, a ministry because we were like, okay, well, maybe we can like, let's make a, let's try to make something out of this. But even then we were a little bit half up, one foot in, one foot out, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know it wasn't like josh was married and he wasn't going to go on tour for eight months out of the year and you know and i even like we all had regular jobs so we're like oh, i don't know if i could go and leave that long and chris was really the only one that was like i gotta do this i have this thing you know in my heart i gotta and you know which eventually led to him uh leaving 
Hmm. And the the album came together a little weird at the end, right? He did his vocals after the fact, without you guys. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we had all the song, we had everything written, and yeah. we had all the music recorded. But you know, it was really interesting because at that time he was just the buzz. Like we we had a buzz going around further, and then his dashboard stuff that he started doing, like the buzz was just insane. Like, uh, I mean, being around it was just like, wow, this is like, there's something going on here, like something special, you know? I remember it was like at, at Cornerstone Fest. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that festival. It's like a big festival in Illinois. Um, and um, further played and Tooth and Nail was doing a showcase and I was like, hey, man, you know, a lot of people are asking you about Dashboard. Like, you know, he had that Swiss Army romance. This is before the new uh, The Moon is Down came out. He had his friend Amy who, from Fiddler Records, you know, basically was like, ah, I really want to put out these songs. So it's like, OK. I mean, it wasn't like a big deal or anything, um, but he went in and recorded these songs and um, it just like caught fire and I was like, yeah, you should play a sh like an impromptu show here at, the, at Cornerstone, which is like, you know, people camped out. It was a really cool vibe, um, but I can't believe I just said cool vibe. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nate loved that. it. It's so Cal, <laughs> so Cal Nate loved it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, so that was like his first show. He just like, and he was like nervous and it was awesome. But yeah, so he um, just just caught on like like crazy, you know. It he was an acoustic guy and he was playing shows with H two O and like doing all the face to face and like all these bands and just like people loved him or they hated him and uh, yeah. And then further, you know, kind of caught, you know, after he left. You know, I'm working this nine to five job and we're like, well, what do we do? Do we, I don't want to stop playing music. If we look for another singer, I, I mean, let's just, just get another singer. What the hell, you know, which was hard because, it, you know, you put, we put out like a call to see, you know, for singers, like on our website and like, it was, you know, you get submissions in it in, in on tapes and like it was just like the weird it was so it's probably like through bizarre. computers computer microphones and you know tapes and all that i can imagine not even computer microphones no. it was like four <laughs> tracks yeah but it's probably harder back then to find somebody too right you're like today people can right. email you everything or send you here's here's everything i've done digitally it's so much quicker right yeah, and I think we ended up finding Jason because um, so we did a, a Weezer tribute record. Um, this was when Weezer was broken up. And <laughs> so we did, it's kind of weird now, Weezer tribute record, all their stuff. But anyway, <laughs> but um, and it was on Dead Droid Records, and Jason had a band that was on there as well. And they, the, owner of the record label kind of put us together or like introduced us so now weezer is do, doing weezer tribute records essentially <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> yeah crazy so chad one thing i was thinking about like leading up to this interview is i actually don't know the history of the band name further seems forever so before i ask you that i want to qualify it by saying there's a segment we want to do on this podcast down the road which is band names that do bands disser a disservice and then there's band names that like fit the band to a t and i think strong arm and further are in the latter camp we're like they're perfect so i don't know who's the brainchild behind them i those. think strong arm is the stupidest name oh ever. it's perfect <laughs> it i remember so i remember with strong arm we were like sitting in this is kind of weird, uh, but like Chris Carbonell lived at Josh's house and with his parent, with his mom. And Josh was actually away in Canada visiting his dad for the summer. And we we're all saying, we we're like, oh, we got to make a name. And we we're like, we want to sound really tough. Like, 
<laughs> really. <laughs> and we, we like had these names and strong arm was one of them. And Jason, the singer at the time called Josh up and, you know, it's like, Hey, what do you think about these names? Strong arm and some other name. And he's like, Oh, that's okay. You know? Oh yeah. Let's keep looking. And then the next thing you know, the name of the band strong arm josh came back from canada and was like what what the heck <laughs> what is his name you know it was stupid but it's stuck right and, it, and i mean it worked yeah. it worked for i don't you. know kind of my my feeling was like there's so many bands you you kind of fall into your band name right mm -hmm. yeah okay there's, yeah that makes sense you know you, you have like gorilla biscuits it's terrible <laughs> yeah. but like yeah. the, you know we we, we came up with we spitballed like 10 of them the other night i'm like this would be this is a good segment let's save this one yeah we have a list yeah. of terrible names even some <laughs> bands that are huge just terrible names yeah 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 oh yeah well it's funny like, you're wearing a terror t-shirt it's like i love terror but i would never wear their merch just like you know i'm, I'm not gonna wear it in an airport you know <laughs> oh no i wouldn't wear it no. Yeah, it's like the band ISIS. You don't want to wear the ISIS T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, they they get a bad rap after the fact, though. That wasn't their oh, fault. Oh gosh. <laughs> yeah, man, I couldn't imagine American Nightmare. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, there's a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. It will, actually, that's a, there's a funny story. So, like on 9/11, we um we were this was further. We were staying with our friend Marty. Um, and he lives, he's actually in that band Zeo um, now, um, but uh, he uh, lives in Pennsylvania in a, in a town, I think it's like outside of Greensboro, Pennsylvania or something like that. But it's a really old town, like his house doesn't even have like a address because it was like made before George Washington was president. Like it was like a stop on the underground railroad. It's like is blatantly a haunted house like it was yep. but so we're staying there you know in, on tour and he flips on the tv in the morning and it's 9 11 you know and everyone's just like oh my gosh what's going on and uh, you know everyone's outside his house like there's like air raid sirens going on the plane that went down in pennsylvania was mm. like 20 miles away from his house wow and um we were like uh you know everyone's trying to you know cell phones were like these little these flip phones with these antenna you know we're trying to call home or whatever and we got the trailer open we have all this equipment and like in comes this like sedan with like total men in black like guys fbi and we because a lot of the guys like had like jason had a shirt on from that band martyr uh steve had a shirt on that was like militia group you know which was a record label and like the people i called the cops on us because they're like look at these guys yeah you got typecast so they, <laughs> which yeah, isn't <laughs> militia group is isn't heavy music is it no no but the name is enough yeah that's what yeah. i mean that's the irony yeah yeah, it was just a name. So, wow. you know, they basically looked through our stuff and they were like, oh, yeah, we got like 10,000 calls in like five minutes or something. Oh, Not about us, but so, yeah, it was just one of those situations. Crazy. It was a crazy day for everybody. <laughs> just, yeah. I, it just, I, you were tw 20 miles away from the Flight 93 going down is, is nuts. So, further seems forever. Did, so, it was that your uh, brainchild or? Oh no! So, yeah. <laughs> we, wow. Did we tangent like right that? there? Yeah. Oh, of course we did. It was great. Uh, um, no. So actually, like we had a bunch of names. I think we might even have used um, for some amount of time. But um, Nick wrote a letter to someone. I, I don't remember who it was, but in the letter it said Fur "further seeming forever," and we we're like he had brought that and he was like, Oh yeah. You know, I think further seeming forever could be cool. And we're like, how about further seems forever? That's yeah, pretty cool. You know? So yeah. So that was that. I mean, it wasn't like some crazy like backstory, but um, it's funny. Like I, I wasn't sure if it was like from a, a, you know, song lyric of a different song. Cause like when I was, listening to the sound there's the line 
Black My Heart. And there's that like mosh metal band from New England called Black My Heart. So I'm wondering if they got their name mm -hmm. from uh, you guys. Oh uh, yeah, it, it's <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that band, but yeah, yeah, it's funny. Like there's there's bands like there's a band called Advent out there. That's sort of like a hardcore band. They it's like, like the ex beloved guys. Miracle. Is it the beloved guys? It. it um, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. But um, um, then there's like, uh, yeah, but like historically, like Hatebreed is a misfit song, right? Texas is the reason is a misfit song. Like, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, art imitates life, imitates art. I mean, that's yeah. what yeah. happens. There you go. <laughs> um, so you put out How to Start a Fire with Jason, and then you lose a vocalist again. At, at like yeah. at that point you guys got to think what are we doing maybe we just need to be done well, or but you, you you persevered you what you kept going yeah so i mean a lot so jason was in the band the longest i mean so we toured a lot before we actually did how to start a fire um and we just kind of had this attitude like we're just we're just going to make this happen we're going to try to play as many shows and stay on the road on the road as long as possible and that was just kind of our our plan you know mm -hmm. um and you know a lot happens and and jason was the youngest person and you know yeah you know, you're with people for so long that you know you just you you eventually hate something about that person you know and uh so yeah so jason ended up leaving again while we were recording our record we had everything recorded that's and crazy. so we're at this like crux like what do we do we have all this stuff i think if we hadn't had the songs we probably would have just been like ah we're good you know but we had the songs and we just like we just want to get it out there but you know also at the same time we're like what else do we do like this is all we know kind of thing right. and um we still wanted to do it, you know? And we were like, hey, we did it once, let's do it again. So, um, but at this point, we we weren't at that point in our lives where we wanted to grow, you know, grow with someone. We needed someone that was gonna be able to just step in and get right to it, you know? And like I mentioned earlier, John Bunch, the singer of Sensefield, um, was always one of our influences you know and uh you know just his the way he sang and the band sensefield but um so sensefield had just broken up like a uh, couple months before and we had some new some friends that were in common and uh like our tour manager chuck was tour managed for sensefield for a while and we jason actually uh, his um, girlfriend at the time, band Element 101, they were, um, they had toured with them. And so, we, like, we sort of, like, were in the same circles. And we just reached out to John and said, hey, you know, we got this stuff. Let me send it to you. And, you know, are you interested in doing it? You know, and if you are, let's, you know, John flew out to Florida and met and, you know, just, he, you know, John, had, John was such an easygoing guy. Like if you ever met him, he, you know, anyone that ever knew him never had a bad thing to say about him. Um, and it was, uh, he was just very easy. He was a consummate pro and was able to just come in. And it was a hard, it was a hard thing to come into. And he basically stayed at James Wisner's house. Um, that's our producer, was our producer. And just nailed, went through these songs and just nailed them, you know? And it's interesting in the lineage of further because you have those people that are either, either love hide nothing or they're like, this is terrible, you know? And it was a hard thing because, you know, being like a band in the scene, you know, uh, seeing like older guys out there, like it wasn't like a heartthrob kind of guy right? Um, that was on vocals. Like it was different, 
you know, it, re- it, it was more different than Jason and Chris, even though they were different, but um, it, it was a different feel, but it's one, it kind of our philosophy was we're not trying to replicate what we already did. We're not trying to find some, we're not trying to find the guy who sounds like Steve Perry, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> We've made that joke before. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, you know, it's not karaoke. We want something that's going to bring their own thing and we'll make it, you know, we'll make a different song out of it, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, and it, that was hard um, because the passion, a lot of the passion that I had personally for, for doing it, like, was drained out because at that point when Jason left, we were at our most popular. We were finally starting to see the fruits of our labor pay off and, like, just in it, to see just get deflated like that was, was hard. So to put that in context, uh, my dad has seen you guys. He saw you guys on that Newfound Glory tour. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice. So it shows you the reach you guys had. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, that was that was around that time, that, that Newfound tour. Yeah. yeah, so like, and that's another band from South Florida and Newfound, you know, like Chad, the guitar player, was the singer in Chilud, but he's the little Chad. And, uh, <laughs> but basically um yeah i mean that was the time period you know and even though that i like i actually had did merch for newfound glory um and was really like they're our friends you know they're like my friends you know and uh they gave us that tour they're like you earn this we're not just giving this to you because you're our friend you know what i mean that's Which awesome kind of meant a lot to that's cool. And that kind of goes back to what you were saying with, you know, the scene back in the day where it was just different styles of bands. And it sounds like, you know, you've toured with every type of genre. Like you said, Zayo, She Found Glory, you know, the Ataris is kind of all over, which is really cool. Ataris. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I always found that interesting. And we always try to take bands out with us that were either our friends or that we really liked, you know, um, like, and sometimes it bit us in the ass, you know. Uh, I remember, so like one of the bands, like my good friend Tom and some of my other friends were in this band, uh, As Friends Rust, that later changed their name to Salem. We decided to take them on tour and our management was saying, no, take Fallout Boy on tour, take Fallout Boy. We're like, no, I, you know, this is before they were Fallout Boy, but yeah. You know, that might not have been the best decision, but, you know. <laughs> no kidding. You, you do you, man. That's that's what you guys <laughs> yes. have done. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> Nothing wrong with yeah. that. So do you do you think coming from the transition from strong arm to further seems forever like that, did it give you guys a leg up in that, like, you kind of, you had been in bands and whatnot, or do you think there was a camp that, maybe thought you guys were trying to, you know, cash in or sell out because it was a change in, in, you know, in music, um, style, certainly. You know, we never got the sellout thing because we didn't like make commercial success, you know, really, you know? Um, but the one thing that I was always proud of is I felt we were genuine, you know, and we didn't try to put on some front, like, you know, wear makeup and like do all these things we weren't and if we did want to wear makeup it's because we're really into makeup you know what i'm saying <laughs> like is that an oc metalcore uh disc <laughs> <laughs> no it's not it's got their own thing. we did we, i mean they might be into- with 18 we did 18 visions and you know but um yeah i mean so but i i just feel like that was that was the special thing that we had had was we were from the hardcore scene and what was special about that was that when you go to see a band you're not going to say oh this band is so awesome you're with the band and you're singing along with the band and we always wanted to bring that element like that's that's the awesome part of being in the band to us you know and even Chris like that's how Dashboard kind of had that 
whole yeah. thing where people are singing along, you know, that, that was just, you know, that's what we wanted. We wanted that vibe that it was everyone together, not like a hardcore show, not like, oh, look at these guys in their light, like laser light shows. And like our biggest influence is like Fugazi and their, their ethics that I don't think anyone will ever match ever in the mm -hmm. history of music ever, you know? Yeah. But, you know, it's so respectable and genuine, like I said, and I think that that's kind of the thing that we, when you asked like being in that scene, did that, you know, that gave us that DIY attitude, that like work ethic attitude and the humbleness or trying to be humble at least. I'm so humble. No. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I always appreciated when bands would, you know, they would be open to talk to. And, like, it was so awesome when you see a band that you love and they're just like, hey, man, how's it going? You know? You hit on Sorry, a couple man. things there that, that totally, I mean, that's, again, you're describing, I feel like you're describing us, obviously in a different medium, but mm -hmm. um, the doing what we want to do, doing it together, being DIY, being, um, around people that we like, uh, you know, that all that stuff rings true for us too. So like, to, it's, it's fun to hear that. And I think the thing that we've, this is our 19th episode. So the thing that has come up the most often for us is people being genuine and people yep. being around and uh, in the moment and willing to talk and just being a good, a good human. And, you know, th this is why we wanted to have you on to, to talk about all that stuff. And, you know, you guys have had a crazy journey as far as, from start to finish with strong arm into further seems forever and all the, the hurdles you had to jump. It's just genuine is always going to be good in, at the end of the day. So that's been really cool to hear. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, essentially be kind to each other, be a normal person. Don't be something that you're not. And that's kind of the ethics that we grew up on and kind of lived by or tried to. Because the, the thing that kind of prompted me to ask that question of like the, you know, if you guys sold out or cashed in is I was looking at, I think it was either Hellfest 02 or 03 lineup. And you guys are definitely the only band with your sound on that lineup. So, you know, it gets me back to like, obviously you guys were accepted in a lot of different scenes, whether it was previous connections, yeah. pre previous sounds. It was just cool to see. We love that stuff. I remember being a little intimidated at that that fest, actually, now that I think back to it. But, you know, once I got there, I'm like, hey, you know what? I actually, like, sh I think Shiloh played it. And then, like, just, like, seeing a lot of people, like, even from South Florida, like, uh, the guy who was playing, he played drums for the Bouncing Souls for a long time, Mike McDermott. He was in that band Tension, you know, and he's actually playing with Joan Jett now. Like he's oh, wow. Art, which wow. is so interesting. It's funny how the music scene, like, like it, it's like, I call it like I, it was our high school, you know? Um, but, but yeah, that Hellfest one was, was intimidating. So, but once, once you kind of get there, you're like, Hey, wait a second. I actually, you know, we're friendly with a lot of these bands and people there. And like, I think like new end originals played, that and we had to toured with Jonah. Well, speaking of where we're at today, so the current era, Chris came back. And you can you yeah. tell us a little bit about how that came about? Yeah, so we did, it was like a surf and skate fest in uh, New Jersey. And uh, it was, I forget what year it was. It might have been oh, 2005, four, five, six. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Anyway, uh, they wanted, uh, Dashboard was playing. They wanted further to do uh, Moon is Down We were like, awesome. Yeah, let's do it, you know? Uh, and it was so inspired. Like, people were so into it. Like, it was like, oh, my God. This is amazing, you know? And Chris, like, we just, just always, like, that. there's something about the original lineup. Like, I think each lineup is special, but will always have that like kind of special place because that's where you started you guys everyone started mm -hmm. together you know mm -hmm. and um so uh yeah so we did that 
and we're like, hey, we should do do some more stuff, you know, maybe write something. We do some shows here and there, like like we actually did a tour with Dashboard. We did, um, you know, sometimes we play shows with Dashboard when they come to town or paths would cross or something like that. And Chris actually was living in New York at the time and uh, moved back to Florida. And so we we're just like hanging out. And we're like, oh, we should probably just like write some songs or something. And like I said, our method of writing music is so slow. It took us probably like three or four years to write Penny Black. Wow. Um, and uh, in Chris's like home, or not home studio, in his studio. And we just, it was, it was more of a hangout. It was an excuse for us to get out two nights a week and just write music, laugh, you know, not have to, you know, just for all the, for all the reasons we started the band, there was no pressure. There was no like, Oh, you have to have an album come out this time and this and blah, blah, blah. And, and that was, it was awesome. It was just a great experience. It really highlights what you were saying about being genuine. And that's just that, you know, like take your time, there's no pressure and the best things come out of that, you know, like tools notorious for taking one decade per album type thing. <laughs> but every time they put right, every time they put an, put out an album, it's, it's, it couldn't be better. Right. Cause they've, they've trialed and aired pretty much everything. Maybe they might even left some songs off of their albums that would also be gems, but um, you know, being genuine sometimes takes time. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, even if the truth is, even if it songs sucked, I would have still been like, "This is awesome." Yeah. <laughs> but, but the songs um, didn't suck. That's the good thing. And it was, yeah, it was on your terms. Like I'm sure, once you know, labels heard that you guys were, you know, the prospect of coming back. I'm sure. I don't know if feeding frenzy is the right word, but if I'm, you know, a lot of, I think what Rise, Rise put it out. Uh, yeah, yeah, labels of that ilk would be all over it. Yeah. And that was another weird thing. I mean, cause well, Chris was used to it, you know, Chris, you know, when we started writing that record, he actually like just got off tour with Bon Jovi. Right. <laughs> and so, wow. um, yeah, but that was like one of the most, I mean, I don't know if I'm speaking for him, but it was, it was miserable for him, not because Bon Jovi, they were like the nicest guys, but it was the fans just were not accepting of, what he was doing you know but so at that time he you know like a little bit a little taste of you know oh let's go back to where we came from was was awesome you know Um, and i forget exactly where i was going with that story but you were you were able to you you're hanging out with an old friend and it turned into a new album which is really cool um the other i the question that's kind of come into my mind while you were talking about that was the um the technological aspect must have been so much different yes. from 98 so that's what to, i was saying it was yeah. not from 98 to what 2012 that that, the, that must the, be way different yeah yeah i mean well even from just when we did hide nothing it was it was big and the music industry had changed so much it was really different like just things like um when it came down to sequencing the tracks, like that was one thing that I always loved doing. Like, okay, how do we build this mood of a record? Which mm-hmm. songs go where in the record? And how do we tell the story of this? Well, it wasn't so much about that anymore because you want the bangers to be up front because of app iTunes and they only hear 30 seconds sampling and you got to get it and the songs <laughs> this. And it was just like, this is like, really weird you know and just okay you don't you know everything's downloaded now and i mean it wasn't in the dark ages the whole time but just the whole vibe around the music industry how uh labels can really help you was was just a different different thing it used to be all about the distribution and it wasn't so much about that anymore but just the fact that we could record an album on you know in the studio that chris built was you know technologically just night and day from when we used Mm -hmm. to record you know you'd have to go into the studio and have these big budgets and 
then this guy had to mix it and then this and that, you know, where essentially we did that, that record ourselves, you know, yep. we had um, some guys helping us like John Clark and Ryan Alexander and Mike uh, Fanuel, who was um, Dashboard's uh, front of house guy. Which is cool, right? Because now you have ownership of the music rather than kind of handing it off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's funny, you know, when we signed with Tooth and Nail, we had sent we had sent that demo to just about every label, Jade Tree and, and uh, Vagrant and and uh, basically every popular label at the time. And the only one that really wanted to do anything was Tooth and Nail, and they were the label that Strong Arm was on. And you know, it was awesome. But you know, but you know, nowadays. You know, it's funny because the, one of the owners of Vagrant ended up managing Chris and was like, I never got that demo. And I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, you know, they there's a lot of investment, you know, into a band, you know. You got to be sure. That just br- brought me, like, just got like a memory from, did you, did you guys ever see the movie This Is 40? I haven't seen it, no. no. Oh, I've yeah, seen- yeah, with Paul Rudd. Paul Rudd, yeah, and he's working on his record label that's like financially strained. <laughs> and his employee, Paul Rudd's employee, is like, "Well, we would have been doing doing better if we had signed X Band." And it's like, "Well, you you passed on uh, Arcade Fire." He's like, "Everyone passed on Arcade Fire." <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. true. It's true. Not that we're Arcade Fire. But... <laughs> I know, um, I guess fast forward in the current era, I know Furnace Fest was supposed to make a comeback this year, but it got postponed uh, uh, next year. And it was kind of cool the way they kind of tease the bands. And certainly you guys are in there. But what I thought about is who's singing on that? So who who was it, Chris or Jason that, that was planning on singing, singing that? Uh, it was going to be Jason. It was going to be Jason. It was going to be Jason, yeah. 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 So besides that, do you guys have any shows planned? <sighs> well, so... 2021 is the 20-year anniversary of Moon is Down. Um, We're planning on trying to do some stuff. We always talk about writing some more music and talking to Chris um, and the rest of the guys. And we're totally, everyone's kind of on board. But, you know, with this coronavirus thing, it really makes it difficult. And Chris actually was in a pretty bad motorcycle accident recently. Oh, wow. And... uh, yeah, like he broke both of his shoulders and he's like recovering. It's like pretty bad. But yeah, so I don't know. I mean, uh, we, but that's kind of like what we, what we love about it is that we're in the fortunate situation that we can do it when we want, when it feels right. There's no mm-hmm. pressure. Like if, if you got to like go on family vacation and don't want to do it, no big deal. It's fine no pressure, you know, or, or whatever it is, you know, but it, it's a little bit more difficult nowadays because Josh and Nick and Chris all moved to Nashville. So they live in Nashville and Steve and I live here in South Florida. So it's a little bit more difficult. Wow. So maybe we might see a tour around that, maybe like an anniversary, maybe repress on wax for, uh, for that album as well. Maybe. Nice. Yeah. It's a good idea. You heard yeah, it here first. That would be cool. That would be yeah. cool. Yeah. Twan made a prediction on the last episode for what 2021 is going to bear. And that's one of them. Yeah. Repress. Year of the repress. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Like how vinyls come back. And it's awesome. You know, um, we're that all was vinyl nerds. Thing. We love that stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I sold a lot of my vinyl, like a couple, probably about 10 years ago or something and but it, like early on in the uh the, during this pandemic we uh me and my wife were watching uh, high fidelity mm-hmm. and we were like oh we you know we're gonna start listening to records every night and just hanging out and sipping wine and you know just <laughs> yep. listening. we went out and bought a record player and we've never listened to a record on it <laughs> oh sure yeah. <laughs> it's an undertaking it's yeah, just I inconvenient like i could just delete, you know well the smart speaker makes it so much easier to just it click does. click done like there it is yeah 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 the smart speaker is also spying on you so there's that <laughs> that's true <laughs> it's true 
<laughs> it's great. That is that's scary. Yeah. Like I'll say something and like I start getting ads and I'm like, I know I didn't type that anywhere. I oh, know. Sure. Yeah. Like I was yeah. like, oh, I, I was like the Jets suck, but I want them to win. <laughs> like it was like during the playoffs or something and i started getting like oh would you like jets paraphernalia like no yep it's like, insane yeah. my yeah. my fiance yesterday said do you think facebook knows my thoughts because i didn't even look this up but it showed up on my feet <laughs> like i yeah. uh, i don't even probably yeah they know what we're doing at all times oh 100 so. percent. zuckerberg's yeah. listening right now yeah, the pros and cons of uh, the evolution of the music industry. Like you're saying, the having your own studio, obviously the financial gain of having your own rights to your own music, but the analog side of things, uh, going back to Strong Arm in the early 90s, like I'm, I'm a huge 90s fan because of, the, because of the fact that everything was just, well, kind of goes back to that genuine thing. Everything was just super genuine. And not that we've lost genuine universally, but I mean, the record that vinyl record isn't listening to what you're saying and trying to push other agendas on you. So <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. I mean, it's all natural. It was, now, yeah. you know, it was interesting going from strong arm to further and like the, just the recording process, not so much moves down, but the, how over edited everything tended to get during that era and strong arm. It was like, we did it two inch tape. Like I said, up the, the analog tapes for it and it and you know it, we just played it live like it wasn't like there's something about it like i love listening like the old like the led zeppelin records and mm -hmm. you can hear like john bonham's like the squeak on his kick drum and just like the subtle nuances that you don't get and i think bands are trying to get back to that nowadays you know i anytime i hear um you know, they did this one track, everybody was playing together. I'm intrigued by it just as a fan of live music, as a fan of maybe hearing an imperfection here and there and be like, that's, they caught that. That's cool. So, you know, that, that to hear that it's coming back is nice to, instead of having it be all glossy and cleaned up. And I mean, we, we, we edit a little bit of our podcast, but a lot of times we leave some stuff in just cause we're, we're not perfect. Yeah. I mean, you can you can edit out some of my uh uh, uh, uh to, me too. I mean, <laughs> although Chad, it would be cool to hear uh, Earth Crisis All at War on a current recording with current equipment. Right? right? Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> I think so. I don't know if it would be as good. I you know, it's sometimes you listen back to some of that stuff and you're like, oh wow, that was like so sloppy. Yeah. Like like I don't know what like ended up attaching me to it. like you listen to like unbroken life love regret and i was like oh this record's awesome and it's just so sloppy and you're like oh okay but you get it, it is the spirit of it you know mm -hmm. and i think that that's what's important but on yeah, the reverse well, sometimes you hear these old records and you're like wow they're so like tight you know mm -hmm. yep like descendants a lot like for me well that's a band you want to go see live right because you know oh, they're going to yeah. be tight, tight live. So, yeah, yeah. Well, here's a little nerd question for you. A little off, <laughs> off topic to an extent, but um, something about a Mario like world record. Oh, that's Steve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you want me to provide some context, Nate? Yeah, yeah, provide. Yeah, yeah. Provide a little context. So one. we, so obviously, like, for fans of this music and fans that are vintage video games, like you know about. Twin Galaxies and all these records and whatnot. Well, Tony, not me, Tony, yeah. is in our circle like an absolute savant. And like he's growing up with Tetris, leaps and bounds better than anyone we know. But in S still, still better than everybody that we know. <laughs> but in this day and age, you go on YouTube and you see these guys that would blow the doors off Tony. Definitely. So, really, the question is, is like on tour, like if there was a Miss Pac Man. Like, did you guys know Steve was good? So, <laughs> I knew Steve was good, not necessarily at Miss Pac. Like, I knew he was good, but it was like one of those things. Like, oh, Steve's playing Miss Pac, and oh, he's oh wow, he's on one quarter, you know. <laughs> yeah. But like, he like you know we would play like you know we had a Sega Genesis in our van, and we just like he would play Mortal awesome. Kombat and just like and sonic and like all these games and just was like good you know like just like at 
it's like a pattern thing. Like you use the word savant. He's a total savant at video games and drumming. Okay. Like there's something about the patterns of those things that like, like mesh well together. Yep. Um, but it, you know, it, it wasn't until like we saw that uh, documentary King of Kong. Did yeah. You see so that? good. So good. Yeah. So that guy, Billy Mitchell, like lives down here in South Florida. And so Steve saw that and he was just like, you know, it's like you watch that documentary and to me, it was like, oh, this is awesome. But like in a tongue in cheek kind of way, like it's kind of like embarrassing at the same time, like classic arcade game, like being stupidly serious about it. Yeah. Awesome. And Billy was in that doc. Yeah. So, um, and he's doing it to to be funny anyway but so steve was like got way into it and was like oh i'm gonna start playing miss pac-man again and he would like go and like i'd get a call and he'd be like hey i shattered the record at dave and busters it's uh <laughs> you know like awesome. randomly and like like you watch him play and he has like all these like it's insane like i i do miss pac-man and i get to like level three and it's like i, I just i can't i'm done you know but it's like it, it really is insane and then so he started getting into that and um you know eventually like he actually like became pretty friendly with billy mitchell uh through this guy nice. um, that owns like a like I think he went into this like video arcade game sales place here in Fort Lauderdale and was like, Hey, I'm interested in buying a, a, a cabinet and like ended up being friendly with these guys. And they were in the scene with twin galaxies and all this. Then Steve started getting into Mario brothers, the original Mario brothers. And he actually, he is the world record holder in Mario brothers Guinness book. That's crazy. Yeah, and like him and this other guy do like a doubles thing in Mario Brothers, and he's like really like involved in the <clears throat> classic arcade game scene, and like then like there's like this whole controversy now about how Billy Mitchell's like cheating, and Steve like helped <laughs> expose him to cheating. And <laughs> it's really interesting. Were you ever? Um... So for the Guinness Book of World Records stuff, like were you his witness? Did you go and watch? And <laughs> because you got to have like, a, like seven people there, right? No, I I don't know how. They, I, so it was verified through Twin Galaxy, and I think that's how they verified it. Yeah. But he, I think he did it at a game expo. Um, so that and then sense. he eventually like they would people would pay him to come like be a guest at these expos that's crazy. which is really funny because he sent me a picture and he was like at this game expo and he has this like hall he has this like video classic video gamer trading card with his face on it where he's like this <laughs> and <laughs> and he's sitting there like and he's got these cards and then he's got these further seems forever cds out like selling them too it's <laughs> like nice. the most random thing <laughs> my friend twange was like sent me a picture i was like wow that's really eclectic okay that's so awesome. random it's awesome so he has to decide between touring with shy halud or going on his um retro video game tour that's funny probably do both right well he's thought he's yeah. not he's Stop being in Shiloh. Oh, is he done? Ago. Okay. Yeah, that was like, yeah, they went through probably like fifteen drummers like, by that by then. that point. Yeah. yeah. That's that's but, fun. Yeah. That's that's great. <laughs> we we actually like so during Penny Black, he was getting like in, so involved in that, and like we snuck like a word into one of the songs, "Kill Scream." So <laughs> yeah, awesome. so there's there's like a lyric in there this precious kill screen. <laughs> no way. That is <laughs> yeah. gold. Yeah, awesome. We geek out about this stuff. I'm going to go back and listen now for it. Don't tell me where, yeah. I'll find it. I'll find it. <laughs> Steve always had the most awesome stories like on Moon is Down the track Monachetti. Um it's named Monachetti. There's a guy that Steve worked with 
his name was Dave Monachetti. And the guy worked 23 hours a day, or Steve claimed he worked 23 hours wow. a day. Wow. So we were like, if a guy works that hard, he deserves to have a song named after him. The yeah. song has nothing, the song doesn't have anything to do with him, but it's named after him. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. So we talked a little bit pre, um, your wife and, and you have a, a nonprofit? Yeah, yeah. So my wife started um, this nonprofit called Art Heart uh, about nine, maybe 10 years ago. And started out as um, she just had this calling uh, to help orphans in Rwanda because, you know, when that whole genocide was going on, uh, we were in high school and just had no idea about like what was going on in the world and just like really spoke, really spoke to her. And she started doing it uh, and it was basically art shows uh, to, uh, you know, try to raise some money and also like promote uh, upcoming artists and started doing that and uh, went to, you know, we decided we were going to work with different charities uh, along the way. Uh, but, you know, there's local orphanages and then basically decided we were going to partner up with a, uh, another organization called Zoe that uh, basically empowers these orphans in Rwanda and other countries and takes these orphans and kind of builds a family unit out of them and teaches them essential like needs like hey you, you know you should get your bed off the floor you can't sleep on the floor how to brush your teeth and things like that um, a lot of these kids were being child trafficked and taken advantage of they help work with the government to try to get these kids land back that they're owed when their parents died uh, you know teach them how to cultivate land or be taxi drivers and like build your own business and you know basically provide for yourself what they were finding was it's it's a three-year program and at the end the graduates would take in other orphans and it was just amazing to see these family units and how that comes together so we committed to um, sponsoring over 200 orphans every three years. So we've been doing that for, uh, I think this is our third group. So it's been like about nine years. And um, yeah, so any money that we raise, we send there. And uh, if you wanna learn more about it, you can go to uh, artheart.gallery and, uh, or you can look up Art Heart on uh, Fort Lauderdale in on facebook and we will put that we'll put that on our socials too uh we'll get that out there for sure yeah thank you absolutely yeah definitely and this that's something that we do on the side you know it's not like it's just it was like i got i started doing it kicking and screaming and now i i've come to love it you know um and that's what my wife's made me better a better person for things like that and think that's a testament to the uh to marriage but um but basically it's just it's like the least we can do honestly mm -hmm. like yeah. yep. something it's something you know and so any donations just goes right there all of it that's cool awesome awesome well you were saying earlier you know be a good human be a good person especially now with the world in its state and i think you know, you may have been kicking and screaming at the, you know, in its inception, but now you're all for it because you know that that's truly who you are as an individual and that's something we can all aspire to. So, yeah. It's awesome. Although I'm not perfect, I, I think I inadvertently told somebody I was going to punch him in the face on social media <laughs> earlier today. <laughs> well, that's better than me. I would just say it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but that's you being yeah, genuine. I, that's you yeah, being that's genuine, true. Chad. That's, you got to be genuine too. That's true. Absolutely. There you go. Yep. <laughs> My man. <laughs> nice. Well, thank yeah. you for coming on tonight. We uh we really appreciate the the conversation and uh 
it was really cool to hear, you know, how you being a self-taught bassist going all the way through with the, you know, the, the, the metal stuff with the, with strong arm and, and then getting into further seems forever stuff. So that was, that was a lot of fun. Thank you guys. Uh, thanks for having me and caring enough to listen to me ramble. <laughs> no, we love it. Yeah, we love it. We really do. That was our interview with Chad Neptune um, of Strong Arm and Further Seems Forever. Um, lots of fun tonight. I mean, that was that was cool. Uh, Twan, you had kind of alluded to how this came about early on in the interview, and yeah. it really just leads to the thought like this would never have happened even five years ago, let alone like ten or twelve or fifteen. The fact that you can just put up an Instagram post as a fan and have someone from that band say hey cool thanks for doing that that's really i mean that's just amazing and that's how we ended up getting chat on so that's pretty cool stuff isn't it Twan? well as you're saying that what i was just thinking about is like the 20 year ago version of that is like if i was wearing his band shirt which and, you are and i am right now <laughs> I'm, I'm that yeah. guy i'm wearing a further seems forever shirt which you can't see but um no it would be if i was wearing a fsf shirt and I walked by Chad and he said, Oh, cool shirt. I'm in that band. And then we started chatting. Like, yeah, yeah. this is the, how this came about was, is the modern version of that mm -hmm. to shows how accessible everyone is in, 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 in any facet, the respect that's paid back. That's cool. Yeah. Through technology and not through the analog, like, yeah. Brushing, brushing shoulders by mistake or, or something like that. Like you did with Buster Rhymes. Don't do that now, bro. Check out our check out Twitter. All this hashtag Buster, Buster Rhymes, Rhymes is huge. <laughs> All this hashtag Buster Rhymes. Yeah, I will too. <laughs> but yeah, it it was cool to see. It was cool to hear Chad talk about kind of the early early days of that mid nineties. Well, really middle to late nineties hardcore scene, which I I love. Like I'm I'm we're we're in our mid thirties, so we're a little too young and certainly not in that region to have experienced it, but. I, and we all do, we geek out on just trying to put ourselves in any era. And, you know, in past interviews, we got it with like Lance Mercer and the grunge scene. And this was no exception. I thought it was super cool. Yeah, we brought ourselves back to a place in time um, that either maybe we were a little too young for, or we weren't in the region for. And to hear how like it was for a band in that place in time and a band member in that place in time. Um that was really cool. Uh, it was it was an interesting conversation as far as that stuff went. It was cool to hear how the evolution of the music was for him, like to go from being a kid in both Florida and then Texas and then back to Florida and, and to be um, self-taught on bass and to be in a, you know, a straight edge Christian hardcore band and then to turn into Further Seems Forever, which is not it's a different sound and then to have different vocalists. Like it was, it, they've been on quite the journey. Chad's been on quite the journey as far as music goes. Um, and to still be doing it even today, pretty crazy stuff. Yeah. I think it shows it's a good timeline for anyone that's, you know, struggling or losing hope, maybe in a band or even a different, you know, career focus that it's not just like a, one big linear, like upward trend to like, you know, you lose band members, you lose steam, you know, but as long as you have the work ethic, I think the highlights that I got out of that interview were like work ethic is extremely vital and um, never giving up and just being extremely genuine all the time. And so they had like that album written and they were like, oh, we could, like, we didn't have this album written. We would just call it a day. So it's almost like, man, we'll get t it takes so much to write music. Uh, this is coming from, you know, the outside looking in because I don't write music, but to have that go to waste but no, they already had it made. So it's like, well, we might as well try to find a vocalist and, and see this through. And then boom, the band, the band continues on. And they, had they not had that work ethic to even produce the music in the first place, they might have disbanded and just gone to some regular nine to fives. So it was almost like that work ethic really brought that band you know, to the next level and continued that legacy, which is really, really cool to see. And I know like, you know, everything happens for a reason or it was meant to be is like the most cliche bullshit. But like, if you think about it, like had Chris Caraba not l decided to leave before the moon is down, comes down, that album would, would have sounded different because I'm pretty sure as kind of the story goes, he did those vocals in isolation. He did those and, and they, I'm sure they had demos and whatnot of those songs, but it was probably like Chris did those songs, handed it back over to the band yeah. and like, that's what they got. 
and that album's a fucking classic. Like mm-hmm. it, it, yeah. it's yep. it's just crazy how it worked out. And sometimes things work out, sometimes they don't. In this case, they they it worked out. Well, and this is one of those you say everything happens for a reason, but um, they really had to um, overcome a ton of obstacles, right? I mean, like first changing sounds, finding a, a new lead singer for a band that. Do they don't even know what their sound is yet because they don't have their lead singer. And then for their lead singer to be kind of on one foot out the door when your debut album is coming out and to go on to become, a, you know, a wildly successful other artist uh, in Dashboard with Chris Caraba to find a new, uh, we got to go out and find another vocalist. And then for him to also leave and then to have to find another vocalist. Like they just continue yeah. to per- persevere and continue to work hard and, and to make, what they wanted happen happen and yeah they're not like the biggest band ever but they they put out some quality music and i would urge any i mean this this podcast alone just prepping for this podcast alone i listened to some albums i hadn't heard before and i was like Mm -hmm. wow these guys are awesome yeah and you'll hear that on the playlist this week that it's it was a really cool venture to go through and find out some stuff about this band and, and like the the ethos and the work ethic and and how they just overcame every obstacle that was thrown in their way yeah i think that work ethic element that you're talking about is is what's being showcased here because it's like people that make it to the olympics they just keep on trying they just keep going you know against all odds you might be like what's that movie cool runnings it was jamaican jamaican yeah, bobsled jamaican team, bobsled team. Yeah. <laughs> against all odds you know like they're gonna be champions in, in a sport that doesn't even exist in their home territory so you know um, I think determination is, is, is kind of a key key word that sticks out from talking to Chad, like, you know, whatever it takes, you know, and the genuineness, you know, combining being genuine with some work ethic at that level, like, I feel like it's inevitable that you will find some success because you, you can hear the genuineness through the songs. And as a fan, we always talk about it on this podcast. It's like, well, you can kind of separate what you can tell is real and what is like either a over overproduced or be like forced or trying to conform to what might be going on seems like further seems forever and strong arm alike are very much coming from a, an honest place that produces music that we can either a identify with or b just like damn this is just straight up good music so yeah you yep, know, it's just, definitely it's, it's proven yeah one observation that i had to kind of like rack my brain on is like in 2020 we know further seems forever as the band that had kind of some of these challenges and whatnot had gone through a lot but i was thinking back to like when i was 16 17 18 19 when, when these albums came out and there wasn't that like the optics of the band was not one of you know triumph or, or you know trials and tribulations or whatever like it's interesting how over time i think maybe it just it, it, it gets back to getting older and having a different perspective but in that moment it was just like this music's cool Oh, they have a new singer. Okay, cool. But now, uh, you know, you, you look back and you think of like the families, the economics of the band, you know, why do people leave? You know, it's the nerdery and it's the geeking out. It's just, it's just an observation. I'm just talking out loud. But um, in the moment, it wasn't, it wasn't something crazy. You know what I mean? It was just like, oh, they have a new singer. And that's why um, it was an interesting interview for us as we now have taken a vested interest in the music industry we like music from all different genres. We like um, people from all different genres. We want to talk to people from all different walks of the music industry to hear a band that, you know, and a guy that's been in a band that's, that's had to go through all of those different changes and to continue to do it. That's something I want to know about. Like, I just need to hear that. And and we think here that you guys want to hear that too. Right. I mean, like Mm -hmm. it's a cool, it's, it's just something that, you, you need to um you don't really get at 17 you're just like oh cool my my favorite band or one of my favorite bands put a new record out oh there's a this sounds different it's a different vocalist i'm gonna look at the liner notes it's a different vocalist who knows why now you're gonna find that stuff out and figure it out and want to know the story behind it and that's you know that's the type of stuff we want to bring mm-hmm. the backstory yeah i don't think you'll ever find a and i don't want to like be quoted on this but it, it i'd be it'd be hard to think that we're gonna bring like a label label plant onto this show because it just doesn't have the same story to it you know you know someone that has been planted by the label to like oh this is going to be a guaranteed success because the story is just not worth telling it's like a pretty obvious if it's plastic you know so therefore you know something that's grassroots or 
you know, been through the trials and tribulations, it's like, it's almost relatable on just life in general. Like, huh, it's always hard. So I'm going to disagree with you, Nate. Yeah. I want to hear from the label plant. I want to hear what's going through their head when they figured out that they were a label plant. I want to know that. <laughs> like, that's, that's true. That, I mean, I don't want 30 label plants on, but I, I do want to talk to one that like, maybe I like the music and I was the person that they made the, the band for um, to see what, you know, when they figured that out and like how, how that became a thing. Like that's uh, may, maybe that's just me. I don't know. I no, it's just, yeah, that's just, passion I just want to, I want to know that. Yeah. Passion is passion. I mean, what's that? What's the boys. What's that other one? You know, those shows where they showcase a singer, like they the still are passionate. Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're still passionate about it. Like, I guess it makes sense. The other thing that the interview made me think about is like in 2020, like you, you think about, or like the younger generation might look at dashboard a certain way, whatever way that is. But like us having, being in the moment, seeing dashboard at their peak, like they were fucking huge or he was huge yeah. before he, you know, he, and then they, um, mm -hmm. but like, I remember in 2003, they had a headlining tour with thrice up in Maine at the civic center. And that's an 8,000 cap. And I'm pretty sure it sold out. Like that's, wild for a guy to come from the scene he came from but then my head goes to like you're chad and you're the further guys and you're witnessing this and it's like our captain jump ship i don't know it's just a wild story it's an unprecedented story and that's why having him on was so cool yeah um just the amount of adversity that they had to they had to go through to continue to be a band was really cool uh, to hear that he just go with the flow like i'm friends with this guy i want to i want to make music with this guy these are my friends these are the people i want to be around that was the kind of stuff that i like to hear because i mean that's it was uh, i told him in the in the interview this is the impetus for our podcast like w you are the guys that i want to talk to about music um we would have been doing this anyway in a text or over a phone call or whatever or going to see shows live why not put it out there for the world to hear and see and and that that stuff's you know why we're doing what we're doing so i can see why a band would want to continue to just make music with their friends and go out and if people are digging it cool go do it good point yeah against all odds just do it see what happens yeah I like nike it. had something there right just do it <laughs> yeah so you're trying to say if one of us left the other two would just carry on and get someone new Yes. Yes. <laughs> no, I don't know. It depends on who leaves and why. Yeah. Yeah. Twan, if you left and became huge, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I'm going to go Shit. just play Tetris live for, for, for money. <laughs> Guys, Joe Rogan has got a spot and I'm the guy. I'm out. Yeah. You know what, man? Good for you. I'm getting Enjoy. that Spotify money. <laughs> Get that Spotify money. <laughs> I've been trying. I've been tweeting at Spotify. They ignore me. Oh, that's awesome. So, yeah, that was that was a fun interview. Yeah. Um. Check us out on the socials at Potty of Slave on Twitter and Instagram. Um, we want to throw out uh, Chad and his wife. They have uh, the nonprofit that he mentioned at the end of the interview, mm -hmm. artheart.gallery, artheart.gallery. Um, that is something you, if you're looking for a, a charity this year that you want to give some money to, go, go do that. Um, it's, uh, you know, orphans in Rwanda that, that need help, um, that don't know how to, you know, do some of the things that they need to do in that country to survive and thrive. Um, they've brought that together for the last 10 years or so. And um, go check that out. Yeah. And that, it just speaks to, it, it's an extension of him. And, you, and again, we, we only talked with him for 90 minutes or whatever it was, but you could tell, you know, that's an extension of him and his wife. So that was super cool. Yeah, that was awesome. Like you said, it highlights him as a personality and, and his wife clearly that they want to give back and something that we should all be kind of thinking about today. So we'll we'll post that on the socials. So uh, check that out. We'll yeah, put you'll all see that, that on our socials. Yep. So cool episode, guys. We'll see you guys all next week. Peace, podheads. Awesome. Cheers, everyone. Peace.